Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming. I am Megan O'Donnell. I'm the Assistant Director for Gender and a Senior Policy Analyst here at the Center for Global Development. And I am so excited to welcome you to today's event, which is going to focus on gender lens investing in practice, both from the perspective of the investors and investees. There's been a lot of energy around gender lens investing in recent years, and for very good reason. As many of you know, on one hand, the evidence tells us we have a persistent problem to address in that women continue to face disproportionate barriers in accessing finance and other support as entrepreneurs, in entering and advancing within the labor force as wage workers, and even in accessing products and services that fit their needs as consumers. On the other hand, we have a tremendous opportunity to grasp because we know that addressing those constraints and supporting women as entrepreneurs, as workers, and as consumers promotes gender equality, benefits women themselves, also benefits their families and communities, and stands the chance to promote a type of inclusive growth that is preferable to the status quo. So we're very excited today to welcome uh, the perspectives of both the investors and the investees. Um, for those of us who are not in the weeds every day of how the deals they make are done, we are hoping to tackle what these deals look like in practice, get a sense for some of the details and, and the impact that they're having. So we're going to start with some remarks by three very successful business women. Um, joined uh, today, we've got Rosario Bassan, who is the founder and CEO of Donper, Priya Krishnan, who's the founder and CEO of Clay, and Viola Llewellyn, who is the co-founder and president of Ovamba Solutions. They're going to walk us through the challenges that they've faced in starting and growing their businesses. They're going to talk about how they're promoting gender equality within their own workforces and talk about how they're benefiting women and their families as consumers in the agribusiness industry, in childcare, and in financial technology. After we hear from the three entrepreneurs, my colleague, Nancy Lee, a senior policy fellow here at the Center for Global Development, will chair a discussion between Rosario, Priya, and Viola, and development finance institution, Gender Lens Investors. So we've also got Suzanne Gabbery, who is the Chief Investment Officer at FinDev Canada, Catherine Kaufman, who is Managing Director for Global Women's Initiatives at OPIC, and Graham Wrigley, who is Chair of the Board at the CDC Group. They're going to talk to us about how they identify firms like Rosario Priya and Violas and how they support them. So without further ado, we're going to get started with Rosario for her remarks. Thank you. Shall I go to it? Well, good morning. I am very honored here to be representing the women from Peru. I want to thank FINDEP for the opportunity I have to share about uh, my authentic commitment and uh, the permanent uh, fight and journey in the favor of the sustainable development and gender equity, which I believe is a required condition for the economic growth and the social development of my country. On the other side, I am sad to say, but it is necessary to realize that my country, Peru, is one of the most violent countries against women, according to World Health organization in its annual report 2016. Back in the 80s, when I graduated from university as an industrial engineer, which was not so common at that time, the overall situation in Peru was very hard. No future, no hope. Due to the extreme violence we were living, very high unemployment and extreme poverty. 60% of poverty. And <clears throat> that means that from every 10 Peruvians, six were poor with no access to the basic services 
for human development. And women especially didn't have the opportunity to get an income, to get a job, so they could be able to bring up their families ahead. In these circumstances, I really wanted to make a difference for my country. And I dreamed of building a company through which I could contribute to change the reality of my country by generating dignified jobs that would reduce the poverty in a structural way. And also by breaking the vicious circle that was impacting millions of women and men. Women such as Vilma Amaya, who had no chance to get a job in order to lift her family out of poverty. So this is how in 1994, 25 years ago, I had the blessing and the opportunity to co-found a company together with my Peruvian and Danish partners. Ironically, at this starting point of our company, I faced women discrimination right in my face in a tough way. I was rejected to be the CEO of our company by my own partners just because I was a woman. They really believed that in a country like mine, I was not going to make it because of the strong discrimination against women. So what they did in the first board of directors is not, they appointed me to be the interim CEO. They put that in the first board of directors, interim CEO. So because they really thought I was not going to last long. So what I experienced was not a glass ceiling. It was a cement ceiling. A cement ceiling that I needed to break in order to move on and to make my dream come true. So instead of crying or hiding under the desk, what I did was to decide not to be a victim and not to wait for somebody to give me the power to act and fight against the prejudices. Instead, what I did was to take the power, to empower myself, to take the power from my inner strength. So that is how I experienced this uh, big hit for women discrimination. After 25 years, nowadays, after 25 years of being appointed interim CEO, I have proved very clearly that being a woman must not be, at any circumstance, a limitation to go ahead and be challenged. And of course, to go ahead and get leading positions. That's what I have proved. And also, if I go, if I go backwards, I can see that the urgency I've always felt to change the reality of my country, supported with my strong values, such as the respect for the dignity of the people and the character I've developed throughout these experiences, definitely made that I um, could work in a very uh, important and relevant challenge for me, which was to make out of Damper a vehicle for true sustainable development. That's what I wanted to do through my company, making a vehicle for true uh, sustainable development that could impact the lives of thousands of women and men, such as, such as Vilma. How did we do that? Establishing programs and services that will have a big impact in the lives of our people, their families, and communities. And we worked on three axes, health, education, and gender equity. And regarding gender equity, 
which is so important and relevant in a country like ours because of being so violent, we created a special program called Victoria. And through this program, we are impacting thousands of women and men, and also young people at the schools, to change the behavior and transform mentalities so that we can eliminate the attitudes that incite discrimination and, vi and violence against women. So far, we have impacted 6,000 women and men, and we have already gotten 500 students at schools that are agents of change for this purpose. And uh, just to finish, I want to say that from all the awards we have gotten, there is one that is very special. And that one is to see how our women have been creating better opportunities for themselves and their families through their dignified jobs and how they have been able to access to health services within our health centers, how they've been able to conclude and finish their school studies within our own facilities, and especially how they've been able to be economically independent. In the, in the case of Vilma, this woman, she is a mother of two kids, a single parent, like many other thousands and millions of women in Peru. And she's been able, through her job and her talent, to be economically independent. Now she's not a victim of domestic violence anymore. She lives with dignity. And Vilma has been able to provide her two kids with education. And through that, she is interrupting the transmission of poverty from one generation to the other. This is how, through our company, we are contributing in a positive way to impact in the lives of our women and men, and especially to empower women to come out of poverty and face life with dignity. And I can conclude that gender equity definitely increases, increases our competitiveness and uh, attracts re and retains talent and especially encourages social peace and progress by reducing the poverty and by creating better human capital for future generations. So thank you so much. And I want to say that gender equity definitely is a condition required for our, the economic growth and social development of our organizations and of our company. Thank you. I'm not sure whether I can be heard. Maybe we'll go without the mic. So I am the founder of a business called K, which is focused on childcare. Um, I talk about the fact that my passion is working with children, and my mission is enabling women to go back to work. So I feel like Clay brought both of those together. Um, why these two is one of the reasons is I feel like if we invest in our children, uh, those that tends to be the demographic dividend that works out for uh, you know, a nation in general. So if you look at India, we have 160 million children under the age of five. We, I believe you know, if done right, this could be the big opportunity for us from where we could land as a country and getting this right early is really important. Uh, the second is from a women workforce participation, India is among the countries which has the lowest women workforce participation. It has 24% women workforce participation. And if you remove the, uh, if you strip out the unorganized sector, it comes into the middle to high teens. Uh, and that just was something that I wanted to work on. So I moved back from the UK and started up a childcare business. The reason why I, I looked at a childcare business was it is the place where uh, women, the most fall off uh, for women workforce participation takes place. Three out of four women cite 
the, uh, the lack of access to childcare as one of the reasons why they quit. Um, and I, I think there's a personal story there as well. So the 20-year-old me wanted, you know, three children and a dog. The 30-year-old me wanted to keep the child and my uh, job. And the 40-year-old me now just persuades other women to say, don't quit, don't quit. You know, you can actually balance the two. So um, from my perspective, there are two broad themes that I'd like to talk about. One is the fact that happy adults equal happy children. And while a lot of folks think about child development as an in isolation, it's very important that the household is peaceful for the child to develop uh, appropriately. And the second, which I feel is, uh, is a really important discussion point and what our business is predicated on, is really the triple bottom line impact of investing in women. So while people talk about both education and uh, you know, women workforce participation as social issues. I think they are pure economic issues. What we've learned through the work that we do is when you employ a woman or allow her to go back to work, she in turn takes what she's earned and puts it into the education, uh, healthcare of the household. And once she's done that, the child comes out well invested in, goes into contributing to the economy. And as a result, you know, the chances of them dropping out from college, going through with an education is much higher when you invest early on. So the fact that she's working, she's contributing to the economy, she's investing in the household, and these children go on to become uh, you know, productive employees for the, for the country is something that we feel works out. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So when we started out, we believed that um, five minutes is really tough. <laughs> So we believe that um, the, I, I started off saying, if I was a mom, what would I look for in a childcare? And I think most mothers look for something better and they will grudgingly settle for equal in a childcare facility. So quality becomes a big parameter for the woman to say, I can go back to work guilt free. So it's not price, it's not, you know, ratios. It is really what can we do to alleviate her guilt when she's going back to work. So the quality of the childcare is a big part of you know, how she goes back to work. The second uh, thing is that so when we, when we set out the service, we just looked at it from the mom's perspective. But over time, we've moved to saying it's not the mom, it is the family that needs to contribute. So dads also need, in an urban context, need to be move from maybe providers to nurturers, and how do you get that whole family context going? This, the thing that I didn't count on was, uh, you know, employees of ours. So we have a reverse gender diversity issue. We have 10,000 children, we have 2,800 women, uh, and about 165 men. So uh, very, very few men in the organization because it lends itself to hiring women. But these women, some of them come from minority backgrounds, and the degree of emancipation we see at the household when this woman's coming in, and it wasn't something I st that I counted on when I started off the business, but the fact that she is working, then she says, I want my daughter to be educated and go to work, and then uh, and some of the you know, backgrounds, like minority backgrounds that we hire from, those women then commit to saying, my daughter-in-laws will work, uh, my daughters will work, and that becomes a secondary emancipation, which genuinely we didn't count on when we started the business. Overall, I think, you know, it's, it's the beginning of the journey. At 10,000 children, we are a blip in the scheme of things in India. Uh, but we feel like this is an important dialogue. The government's having the dialogue. We work with about 400 organizations in India, a lot of them subsidizing childcare. And as a result, we see the uptake to be pretty significant. Uh, we're private equity funded, uh, we have two funds, but I don't think either one of them looked at us from a gender lens, to be honest. They looked at us as, you know, that the business makes sense, it returns the uh, sort of returns that we look at, and if done right, uh, has positive impact. So I will stop at that because I think I'm fairly out of time <laughs> and let you go. <laughs> Thank you. really short so I'm gonna stand up besides I've got a really new dress on <laughs> and I want you to see all of it <laughs> good morning my name is Viola Llewellyn and I am the co-founder and president of Avamba Solutions Inc I love the fact that I know lots of really groovy people in the room 
I want you to dig, if you will, a picture. Imagine, if you will, if there was a way to create a measurement or an index that takes the difficult personal challenges of young women, teenage pregnancy, violence in the home, absent parents, any of those sorts of things, and can create a specific line into how they have overcome those challenges and consciously decided to make some sort of skill set out of it that impacts business engagement, bottom line, and how they lead. I'll give you a really good example. What if the fact that at the age of 19, you were pregnant, had a child, that child died when you were 20? What's that got to do with business? Well, in the case of me, it means that unlike the stereotype that maybe women cannot compartmentalize, the day I buried my child, I took exams. What does that mean in my current business today? That every time I'm told no by an investor and my heart is breaking with panic, I'm still able to carry on. We do celebrate these kinds of tough, gritty behaviors in men. Women demonstrate that in a totally different way. When we think about male leadership, we have names and faces assigned to some of these characteristics. Not so much for women. Let's take another example. I'm a seven-year-old child. My mother has given birth to twins. My younger brother has a heart problem. And right there in London in 1970 or so, my mother taught me CPR for my brother in case she was out and he passed out. At the age of eight and nine, I'd done it twice and called 911. What does this mean as a business? It means that I am capable of doing what is right when under panic and not thinking about the consequences of failure. What does that mean when I have to raise capital? It means that every time I'm told no, I keep on carrying on anyway. People learn to do this in MBA classes. I had to learn this in childhood. Many women take their personal activities, challenges, and threats into business. I did not get to go to university because it is common and appropriate for society back then to punish young women for being pregnant. Do not punish the young guy that laid pipe with the poor wench, but just punish her anyway to show that we have been incredibly upset with her. The same her that will give birth to the children that need to be trained, nurtured, educated with their hopes, their dreams, and their careers put in place so that they can be meaningful contributors to society. Well, I was one of the shameful wenches that decided to drop a child on the planet, had to go through all of that. However, this is important to me and my skill set because while not going to university to become a genetic engineer, I watched my mother doing calculations in her little notebook every night. And she would often try to get me to figure out how to manage the family budget with just a certain amount of money. Fast forward today, my business partner, smarty pants that he is, has an MBA. I don't have one of those. But I watch him try to build bigger and bigger and bigger spreadsheets. <laughs> I'm telling you, its size does not matter. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Whereas my idea is, well, why don't we just take simple back of the envelope math, sit down, extrapolate, and see if this works? Now, I don't know how to put in all your little circular formulas, but to me, common sense will win the day. And I know for a fact, MBA notwithstanding, that you need to keep your finances simple even when you're being as creative as heck with your business models. I don't think that my mind would be wired to understand outside the box of limitation from education and classical business theory if I had not gone through the struggles that I had. So I ask you yet again, dig if you will a picture of those young women like myself who did not have the formality of education based on the way we treat young women when they make mistakes and think about just how strong, gritty, common sense and able we are to steal mentorship from smart white men, which is what I did when I bullied my way into working for IBM, a few lies here and there, I just knew I could do this. I will emulate the best possible standards in order to do my job, just the way any CEO or leader reads voraciously to look for best practice and best benchmarks. 
because I believe that, centrally speaking, most women have the attributes of global CEOs. Their job from morning to night is to seek opportunities, maximize opportunities, manage resources, nurture talent in their children, support, support the careers of husbands, boyfriends, or whatever the case may be, and to continue to make sense of everything around them on a daily basis to ensure that the human beings in their charge are becoming very strong contributors to society or to business. Business at the end of the day is common sense. How you engage in relationships is personal. It's based on your authenticity. When my business partner, Marvin, is speaking to people about the technical aspects and challenges of what Avamba does, which is a phenomenally interesting way of funding Africa's missing middle, those SMEs with trade finance on a non-interest-bearing -interest way, that, I believe, comes from the fact that women are wired to see things from a blue ocean perspective. We may not always know how to frame what is obvious and what everybody would use a classical education to figure out, but we're able to look for the niches and the spaces where human beings exist in their authenticity and build relationships and leverage those relationships to build value. My time is up. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate it to chat with you. And all I can say is that every woman is basically a global CEO if you give her the democracy of opportunity. Thank you. Well, what a wonderful start to this um, to this conversation. I, I, I'm absolutely de delighted to be uh, part of it. Um, uh, but before we launch into the conversation, the thing I, I wanted to say is what those um, presentations just showed. If and I don't, I suspect it's not necessary for this audience. Is that um, you know is the tremendously transformational impact of investing in women. Because what we heard in each case is that the notion of empowering women, um, uh, unlocking, the, unlocking the power of women, was not a sidelight to their business founding and creation. It was core to their business model, in the sense that um, in each case, the idea was to uh, have a transformational effect on the, the women served by the business. And as Viola was describing, um, in the creation of the business itself, using the inherent um, <coughs> uh, power of women's strengths, um, a whole array of women's strengths that, that are internal and don't necessarily have to be instructed from the outside. So um, I think that, I think that was profoundly evident in what we just heard. So perhaps I can start um, by drawing in now the leadership of the development finance institutions to start to the conversation. Uh, but I want it to be a back and forth between the investors and the investees. So um, for Suzanne and Catherine and Graham, um, in, in each of your institutions, this notion of um, uh, women's entrepreneurship, empowering women, and gender, gender lens investment is um, very much a core part of your business model. So I wanted to get a sense from you of how, how you do it in each case, how you shape your um, deal search and deal selection um, and investment decision-making process so that you are uh, you maximize your chances of finding businesses like these. So um, maybe, Catherine, we can start with you and then go to Suzanne and Graham. Sure. 
Sure. Um, first of all, I just have to say that was incredible. All three of you are so inspiring, and we're so lucky that we found you. Um, how did we find you? At OPIC, um, to say that gender lens investing is a core part of our business strategy, I. And by the way, when we were planning this session, we really wanted it to be a frank conversation. Most investors don't want to get on the stage with investees, particularly one that we're considering investing in and you know have an open conversation. But we really wanted to be frank. Um, and I would say that it's not um, a core part of our business strategy. We are trying so hard to make it a core part of our business strategy. Um, and the way we're trying to do it, I would say, is threefold. Um, first, count. And um, that is a, a PR exercise, totally frank, right? Um, when I first started at OPIC, and by the way, we've been around since 1971, I started about close to two years ago, we had never considered gender as part of our core business strategy, okay? So we're two years into this long period. Um, and I came to Center for Global Development, and you all had a panel up here, and it was fantastic, and all the data, you know, women are a better investment, and 24 trillion, and everything. And at the end, there was a question, and a an beautiful African woman stood up and was like, I've been listening to this for so long, and we have not had any movement. And it really just kind of took me back, and I thought, wow, I have a chance to, to answer that question. And at the time, we were considering launching 2x the $100 million effort. I went back to OPIC, and we totally changed what we were doing and said $100 million is, is just not interesting. Mm. And literally in weeks, we went from $100 million to a billion. <clears throat> we said we're going to count a billion. We are going to count a billion dollars out the door. And that counting exercise was so important because before we had launched 2x, um, the previous year's portfolio of 137 different projects, only four of them had any component of female ownership. So getting a billion dollars out the door and counting it was very, very important, even if it was more of a PR push. Um, the second thing that happened as a result of that was um, valuing. Because I don't know if any of you are part of um, an investment culture, but it's people. They're underwriting deals. And if they don't really care, if they say we're going to count women, but the underwriters, the people that are making the decisions, don't really believe in it, it's not, you're not going to get the money out the door. So we really had to do this whole culture change at OPIC to actually believe what we were saying and value it. And we got training, and we built a whole team that included a piece of every part of the organization. And we put my position on our investment committee. So we really changed what we were doing so that we could actually practice what we preach and believe what we were saying. And then the final thing we had to do to complete that was get EDGE certified. And that just means that we were going to also be a gender smart organization and practice what we preach. So um, those three things are how we changed the way and are trying to become uh, incorporating the gender lens and the gender analysis into our financial analysis to get to better decisions. Um, but you need all three. It takes a ton of time. I would, know, I would never sit up here and say that we have it figured out and that we are um, doing everything from at every single step of the way. But I think by jumping in on counting, valuing, and what I call the mirror, which is making sure that you're gender smart yourself, um, I think you're taking a giant step in that direction. Thanks so much. I, I totally appreciate your, your candid answer to that question, which starts us off on a very, uh, with a very good tone. So Suzanne, you, are you going to be equally candid? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, <coughs> you know, with FinDev, you've talked about you know the history of, of OPIC, uh, um, and so as the new kid on the block here, we were only created in January of last year. We, I guess, we have the the, the benefit of not having a legacy to deal with, but then you also have the flip side of that: you don't have the the knowledge and the experience and all that things that come with it. But what we've done is that we've built up a, a new organization where you have gender and uh, right at the forefront of all the investments that we're looking at. So when you're, when you're looking at these things, 
we've we've developed a, an impact framework, and uh, so it's three on so on three vectors, and gender is one of them, which is overweighted on that, uh, and the rest is is uh, um, job creation as well as uh, um, environment and climate mitigation. So by through doing that, looking at from the very uh, uh, beginning stages, you can then automatically start to look at the types of investments from day one uh, from a gender angle. Um, and obviously our in, involvement with that, uh, we, uh, you know, your point about in empowering the investment team is key in this because they need to be the champions of, of all these different aspects, gender. Uh, so they need to be sensitive to this. And if they're not sensitive to that, then you won't get those results and that kind of stuff. So what we've also done is we've taken the aspect of uh, Anne-Marie Levesque, uh, my colleague here, she sits on our investment committee as well. Uh, so you have that voice at the table when you're making decisions uh, and looking at those types of things. And when you wear those, wear, you know, when you wear your hat and you're going out into the market uh, and you're meeting clients, you're meeting these fantastic ladies here, I mean, empowering stories, it's quite amazing. You know, those are the types of people that, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you get in touch with, and it is a bit of a network thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, it's, you don't always find the information, you don't always find the contacts, and you hear uh, uh, you know, what's going on, and it's through those networks. And, and you know, some of the, the things that we've heard today is that women sometimes don't help themselves, um, and, and sometimes they're their own worst enemies. Um, so I think that you know, those are the kinds of things when you're, you're trying to, to source, generate, and encourage those kinds of investments, you really do need to follow up on those things and you need to support one another. Thanks. Graham. Um, great. Well, first of all, you know, wonderful, wonderful speeches. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be um, a thorn on this uh, panel of roses. <laughs> you know, um, no, <laughs> But, but um, I think from CDC perspective, first of all, you know, I, I would, um, you know, echo what Catherine said about where we are on a journey. Uh, gender for us, we, we have a five-year strategy with our shareholder. Um, you know, that's how we're governed. And in 2017, we began a new strategy. And during 2016, our shareholder was saying, Look, put gender on, the, on, on that strategy. And of course, people wanted to do it, but being frank, there were lots of other things the shareholder wanted us to do. Go into fragile states, mm -hmm. carry on growing from investing 300 million a year to 2 billion a year. And there was, we were defensive. You know, so gender was a defensive topic. People liked to do it, but it wasn't, it wasn't this conversation. It wasn't, this is an opportunity. So I would say we are, like OPIC, kind of 25% of the way up, uh, you know, onto seizing this huge opportunity. Yeah. Um, and so therefore what I want to say about where we are, please say it, take in that context. I think the three things we're doing, one, just like you've heard from OPEC and, and FinDev, I think, you know, the, the 2X challenge has been fantastic because it formalizes a process by which conversations start. And then as you said, it's how do you get the deal people to kind of own that. Um, and, you know, Liz Lloyd, she's here, our Chief Impact Officer, sits on all the ICs, so it's being institutionalised. And, you know, gender is becoming a more positive, you know, positive conversation at every investment. In addition, we've tried to do, we have the, we've created a new <laughs> facility, a good part of that strategy, called CDC Plus, which is TA, and we're using that increasingly to help break through those cement ceilings mm. and <laughs> issues that uh, things have, um, you know, often gender <coughs> issues having companies. And I think thirdly, the other thing we started to our credit, started doing about four or five years ago, was thinking about the human capital side of this for investing overall. And, you know, through two initiatives, one called the Africa List, looking at entrepreneurs, 10 African countries, and pushing for you know, 40% plus female participation in that, thinking of the leaders in the future. And we set up a thing called Boardroom Africa, um, which is creating, we've now got 800 board ready and we're training them, female uh, board directors. And because, you know, money is only one thing, it's money and capital, it's putting money into the hands of, of people like you guys is make things happen. And I think that's a longer term thing. 
but th 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 those three things are what CDC are doing on our journey. Should I ask a question? Sure. Is that all right? So you invest in uh, funds as well, and you're not directly investing in companies. Mm. So what you heard, what, what you talked about is really encouraging to hear. But in turn, how do you make sure that these funds have the exactly. same outlook? So, so, so one of the things we're doing with CDC Plus is to train our managers, our fund managers, on the benefits, try and convert them to being having a positive mindset. mindset. And you know, increase and that you know, and then through numbers, you know, start thinking about this. And you know, it's really that there's an amazing lady. I I think things change when you see success. Mm -hmm. And you know, she'd be much better than me here, but there's a lady called Runa Alam. We got to our stakeholder mm -hmm. day. Uh, this this year, so we've invested in that. We have a firm firm called DPI. Many of the uh, DFIs in the room invested. It's sad in, in when that's that. the one that we've all invested in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we I, all know. I, there's, I, others, there's the woman. There's others coming. So, so she and she is Bangladeshi, and she's she's created this amazing organisation, mm -hmm. but but as a but a core mainstream private equity firm. Mm -hmm. She started talking with how can we use the two X challenge with her investment. So I think that that's going to be longer because obviously, you know, we have hundreds of fund managers and they have different priorities, but, but we're making a proactive attempt to do that. IFC just completed a report on diverse fund managers and how they outperform their yeah. less gender diverse teams by 20% in cases just mm -hmm. where there's diversity. Mm -hmm. That's a real number. And yet, when we talk to our funds teams, and I, I'm looking at my colleague from CDC because we've had a lot of female fund managers come through, and the response from our underwriters is her track record. Or we need to we see need her be able to raise the capital. And it, it's really hard to get people to lean in, even when you demonstrate the data. So I think it's, it's an opportunity for us. And sorry to take one more second on, on I think Graham made such an important point about um, this idea that we, we have to go in low-income countries, we only have a certain tool, and you want us to create jobs. Oh my God, you want us to focus on women too? And this idea that it's part of an ESG, another hurdle. And we've really, I mean, every conversation we have at OPIC is, this is a huge opportunity, this is a huge opportunity. We've now gone two years with the gender lens. We just had our, our record-breaking year of capital out the door in our small, medium enterprise finance team. I don't want to create too much credit, but I mean, that's because we create a lot of opportunity by valuing women. So I think we just need to keep pushing this opportunity, not another hurdle. Can I add? Um, what might be a slightly unpleasant side to that, that I've experienced in speaking to and being encouraged to apply for capital from female-led funds. It's becoming a bit of a fashion, unfortunately, for some who suddenly say, oh, look, let's all go and start an organization of women funding women. And it all sounds really great. I think by now I have done possibly 40 applications to women-led investment funds. They all say they're looking for something that's interesting and disruptive, but they're also so afraid to fail that they go and stick and align themselves to what else has been done before and quite happily give the excuse as to why they've turned you down. Or their challenge in raising capital means that the equity strips they're, w they're willing to put in place are so tiny for companies like myself or yourselves who've actually jumped the gap and are looking for something a bit more than what they're offering. In many cases, they're looking to fund 100,000 to 500,000, can't do much more than that with their LPs. Or, as one said to me in a diversified group, and this is where what you have to say is so true, well, we really would like to invest in some women-led companies, but the fear we have is if you get to a point where you need more capital and you're successful, Nobody in our group is skilled enough to ensure further success of you because we don't think that people really want to work for women-led companies, really? mm -hmm. especially if you're black, because the angry black woman thing happens. And they admitted to my face, because we're going to have to take you out before you get to a B or C serious investment to ensure that as a women-led investment opportunity that, you don't, that we don't <coughs> fail in the choice we made. So we have to figure out where to cut it short. I was absolutely flabbergasted. This actually happened in New York. Mm. 
So unfortunately, we do need to train some female-led groups to take more chances, mm. to be a little bolder, to be comfortable being outside of whatever is mainstream. Because it's not enough to just show up as a woman and say, I have an investment group. You really got to be able to be very aware in your head when you're either emulating what you think is a stereotypical success trait versus your ability to, to lean in, support other mm. women, and be willing to provide more than just capital and call yourself a female-led investment group. Maybe we can continue this conversation on the, the uh, investee side of, you know, you've, you've all had successes and failures in fundraising. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm interested in, um, you know, what pitches um, are successful with what audiences? Because I think that kind of um, helps to tease out the notion of, um, where where the impediments are. So, for example, um, is a pitch that you're going to impact the lives of you know um, the you know beyond selling them a good or a service, you're going to actually impact lives. When does that work? When does that not work? And then the other uh, question is, for something that is um, you know disruptive, innovative. Um, sort of out of the box. Um, as, as women founders, um, does that pitch help you? Um, you know, that, that this is something very different and new? Or, or um, do they, does it not help you because they are concerned about taking a risk on a woman anyway? And if it's really innovative, that's too much of a risk. OK. Um, what, I, what I can say regarding that is that, uh, at least in Peru, uh, which is in uh, Latin America, uh, women has just had the opportunity to come into the formal market uh, throughout the agro industry. Because before that, I mean, before the, the 80s, uh, basically women didn't have much opportunity to be uh, in the formal market. Uh, most women were basically depending on their partner, on their partners. And the people, the girls that went through the university didn't have much opportunities because the economic growth was so uh, poor and so low. So when we started the agro-industry, especially with non-traditional products, we could see how all of a sudden there were opportunities for, for women, professional women, and also women that never went to school. But they became professional in what they learn to do in the factory. Um, what I tell women uh, in our company is many of them didn't finish prime elementary school, but they have learned to be very professional in what they do. For example, the women that didn't finish primary, but they learned how to peel asparagus by hand, and they do the best peeling of asparagus which is privileged in a market such as Switzerland. Yeah. So we, our company is the main supplier of white asparagus for Switzerland. And how Switzerland, the market, how, why this such important market privileges our company? They select us because they do not only care for the quality of the beautiful peeled white asparagus, but they do care uh, about the history behind that white asparagus. They, the consumer nowadays privileges sustainability. They want to know who peeled that asparagus. How is that woman being treated? Is this company investing in the, in the, in the development of these women? Are, are, are we treating them fairly? So I would say that uh, in our case in Peru, in my company, gender equity, the, the, the effective practice of gender equity in my company has allowed us to be selected by the different markets. I'm talking about in, investors. Uh, IDB chose us uh, about eight years ago to be the first Peruvian comp private company to get such an important credit. It was not necessarily because of, of, of gender at the time, but it was because of the sustainability uh, philosophy we had 
uh, in the company. But later on, I can see how this links to the other because FinDeb, FinDeb came uh, uh, to us when they learned that we as a company uh, are having a big impact, empowering many women. And that is one of the reasons for the growth, the economic growth in Peru, one of the main factors to reduce poverty in a structural way is because women have been incorporated in the, in the uh, formal market. That is the reason. There is not any other reason. We can see that nowadays, uh, from every two workers, one is a woman. In 2000, from every three, one was a woman. And we all know that women are the ones that, okay. uh, when they get the income, they become agents of their change. own destiny, agents of change for their lives. And they definitely use that income into their, the nutrition, the education, the health of the children. So this is the way how we have been able to reduce poverty from 60% to 20%. So that is a great motivation, a great incentive for the investors like FinDeb when they picked us was because of gender equity. So it's not only a matter of our commitment with our country, but we also are picked up and selected by investors <laughs> in order to uh, multiply the impact we are doing in uh, uh, our women. So I would say that uh, definitely uh, gender equity is not only a human right issue. Uh, it is definitely uh, an economic uh, issue. And especially in Peru, with all this violence, what, what I can say is that if we don't do anything from the private sector, if we are indifferent to that, not only the women suffer, no, not only the society suffers, the economy suffers, the economy of the companies and the economy of the country. So I would say that that is what the, the financial institutions watch through us. And that's Alice. really interesting I, I just that, that not only development finance institutions are interested in this, this positive spillover to, um, to the economy of a whole as a whole, but also commercial investors yes. are starting to be interesting. So ours is slightly <laughs> different though, it's a, because the industry itself, so childcare inherently is fragmented. It's, it lends itself to a lot of women entrepreneurship, but uh, not necessarily to scale. So you see a lot of people operating these, you know, just a small uh, center close by, the neighborhood crash, et cetera. So as we were looking at investors, I think the fact that we, you know, we supported both women going back to work as well as the fact that we hired women was, uh, was an interesting angle and you know, was something that they liked about us. But the real reason that they invested in us was because we were able to demonstrate the scale. So the two funds, both of them, one was an education fund and the other one was a consumer fund, I think looked at the basic unit economics and said, is this business sustainable in itself? And in some ways, while I feel uh, you know, this is an important conversation and what we do eventually leads to, uh, just given the nature of funds, it's you know, a 10-year lifespan, they have to return the capital in some shape and form. So they also have to look at unit economics. So it has to make economic sense as well. Um, and the demonstration of scale was a big part of, I think, the reason that they looked at us. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't. And if we were not big enough, I don't think impact investors would have looked at us either. You know, so if we were anecdotal and did five centers with 100 children, we were just one more. And so now the fact that we have 10,000 children and it's a proven model and we're able to scale it, we become interesting. So I think there's a little bit of a segue into how do you become interesting to more impact investors. Yeah. Our <laughs> challenge was very different. Yeah. It's almost like building the steps that you're trying to walk on simultaneously. So you start out with an idea, especially if you're creative and out of the box, and you're constantly pivoting. So it means your audience is always changing, and how you speak to them as your story matures becomes very, very key. Now, between myself and my business partner, um, I'm communicative and chatty, and he's very technical, 
and theoretical and has got a brilliant mind. We would not be here without him at all. The skill between us as a male-female um, founding team is that I often have to understand what he's saying and communicate it in a way that is specific to the audience. And for a long time, we were really quite rubbish at this because we would muddy the story thinking that every little thing that we had to say was terribly interesting, and it isn't. The stuff that you Velcro to your, your, in your mind as, I cannot depart from this fantastic idea, by the time it hits the ether is actually quite crap. <laughs> and if you don't have the ability to be objective amongst each other, or listen to feedback, or watch the eyes glaze over, you will continue to queer the beer, so to speak. Please forgive me if that's an unpolitical comment, but yeah, you'll mess it up, is basically what I'm saying. So we look at the audiences, and I know that we have technology and we have finance. You can't talk about both all the time to all the people. And you've got to be able to figure it out internally as to what are the key messages. Because pitching is, is such an art form. Mm -hmm. And every investor you speak to <laughs> will give you new advice about why your pitch is not so good. You need less than 10 pages. Well, yes, that's because you read it on Google this morning. <laughs> oh, you really need to highlight the founders at the very top. Do you need to do this? You need to do that. At some point in time, you've got to carry your own water. And if you do not show consistent adherence to what you think is important, because I think the investment community speaks to each other. By the time they see you coming again, they've already heard plenty about you from somewhere else. So pitching, different audiences, key themes, agreeing internally that when you're both talking, you're not gonna cross each other out, because that you do get that inherent uh, male-female struggle in what should or should not be said, has become so important to us as we take responsibility for what even the investor who doesn't want you walks away with as an idea at the back of their head, because they might not like you today, come back tomorrow, or they'll go tell somebody else, and you need to make sure that it's, it's positively placed, even if they don't want to invest in you. Um, so I want to go one more question on the, on the financing, and I zero in on the early stage financing. Mm -hmm. The very, you know, the valley of death, or, or whatever you want to call it, um, because, you know, all of the problems that you're describing um, would be intensified when you're first um, going in. And I'm going to then turn to developing finance institutions where um, this is a challenge for them to uh, go earlier stage. But anyway, describe each of you your, uh, how you got over, how do you, how you, you know, um, mobilize your initial finance and got through that really difficult kind of startup early stage. So I call myself the reluctant entrepreneur. <laughs> so I actually got funded when I wrote the plan at London Business School. I refused funding uh, because I wasn't sure. You write a plan and you don't expect for it to get funded. <laughs> and I said, hey, this wasn't what I ca counted on. And I started up the business five years later. Uh, and when I moved, I created all these safety nets around me saying, we will hold on to our house in the UK. I would get my husband to take on a job for three years. I would make sure that we had the option to move back if it all failed. And I had like, you know, 15 things that could go wrong. And his perspective, he's also an entrepreneur, was look, you'll just be richer for the experience. You've had a fantastic career. Why won't you just take three years out, fail at it, you know, become a better person and come back and take on the job? So the there are, there's an upside and a downside. And I really liked what you know, Viola was talking about in terms of your own personal experiences lending themselves to the business. Because I am so uh, conservative from a cash standpoint, I think for a cash flow intensive business like ours, and when we're taking on leverage, which is another part of you know, our business journey at the moment, how you think through it is important. But that was not the question you asked. You said, how do you get over the, the initial hump? I think the fact that I came from a sales career, and I would, you know, it's, it's something that I've asked my children to go through, is go sell at a mall yeah. in, and do a three-minute pitch, because that's really what an elevator pitch is. 
And because I had that, you know, try being in education. Everyone's been through one mm -hmm. and have children going through one. Oh. So when you're sitting in an IC meeting, everyone has a point of view on education. <laughs> so um, for me, just reaching out to friends and family initially was the way we got uh, the first half a million dollars, which got me through the first three, four centers. But we went for institutional funding fairly quickly. I really wanted to challenge the norm in India because people franchised because of the fact that they didn't have access to capital. And I really wanted to test it out to see why, can, why can't capital come into this industry because from a business economic standpoint, it makes an immense amount of sense. So I just started meeting people and <laughs> pitching to them. And I think my sales career helped. So that was you know, a skill set I would ask all women to develop early on. <laughs> You and I share that in common, having come from a sales background as well. Um, I'm recklessly enthusiastic. I lack experience in so much. It's an advantage sometimes. Um, we raised 650000 from friends and family. Um, our biggest individual investor, I think, was carried away with the passion with which I was sharing pictures with his wife of my trips to uh, Senegal, Cameroon, and other countries. And he actually said, what are these? I said, they're pictures from my trip to Africa. He said, where are the babies with the flies on their faces? I said, not so much of that, mate. There just isn't that much of it. Are you disappointed? He said, well, I'm confused because for 30 years I've been giving That's money to some sort of save the children scenario. I said, That's a waste of time. And so the conversation about building nations based on economic empowerment really worked for him. And then when we got our first institutional capital, it's because we were going to a conference and I was recklessly sending PowerPoint presentations to everybody on the list. And my business partner and I actually, I find that we have swapped roles, gender roles in some respects, because we all know the scenario of the really not so groovy guy at a nightclub that goes and talks to every single woman because he thinks he's that great. And even though every last one of these women says, bugger off, I don't want to talk to you. He keeps on going anyway. Well, that's, that's me. <laughs> that's I'm me the too. annoying guy at the nightclub. Yeah. That's me so, too. So my business partner said, why are you sending these messages to people? We've not even done any background checks. And I said, what's there to know? We're great. We want their money. <laughs> By the time I'd finished setting up my presentations, I had four people sitting down and say, I really want to do this. And we raised $1.3 million from a UK uh, institutional investor. And the biggest mistake we made after that was not going back and asking for more from everybody else. else in that That's what should have done. Yeah. But after that, um, I developed a bit of decorum, <laughs> a bit of more professionalism, and a bit more targeting, and allowed Marvin's quiet, sensible voice to, to come through the barrage of noise and bravado that I, I came to the so market So this is the with. tamed version. <laughs> This is the grown-up me. It's the grown-up version of the horrifically, recklessly enthusiastic, we are the champions type person who went out to raise capital nearly six years ago. But nowadays, hint, hint, I have numbers. I have uh, some audited finance. I have unit profitability. I have impact. I have real customers. Um, I but have you're still shorter... recklessly enthusiastic. Still <laughs> recklessly enthusiastic. It's, it's going to be great. I swear. This time next year, we'll be billionaires. So, yes. Um, I, I'm still recklessly enthusiastic, but I have learned a, a lot from people. I've even learned from chatting with you guys in the past. So that's, that's my <laughs> thing with raising capital. Okay, when we started <clears throat> a Dumper, our company, um, in uh, 1994, I don't know if you ma if you know much about uh, that uh, uh, the time in Peru we were under a big uh, impact of terrorism. So uh, basically, our country was bleeding, and there were not uh, banks were not interested mm -hmm. in investing. The risk was very very high. So uh, most of my peers at that moment left Peru to go somewhere else because it was a very risky country. Uh, my husband and I decided to stay in Peru and try to do our best with the knowledge we have gotten in agro-industry. But the agro-industry performance was very, very low. Basically, it was sugarcane and just the starting point of asparagus. We never had an idea that later on, Peru was going to become one of the best producers 
of the finest vegetables and fruits. Nowadays, we grow, we only grew white asparagus at that time. Nowadays, we do green asparagus, artichokes, peppers, the most beautiful avocados, blueberries. And we do all that because at that decade, 1990, some of us were pioneers in the sense of we had the urgency to develop, to explore a different portfolio. We had no idea what else could be done. So we were all the time challenged to see what was going on in the world and what we could do. So at the beginning, how we raised uh, capital was basically the amount of money that my husband and I had uh, saved before we found the dumper together with our Danish partner. The Danish partner brought capital and there was a fund called IFU, Industrial Fund for Developing Countries, that they accompany the Danish partner. So what it was important for the Danish partner, our Danish partner, was basically to encounter Peruvian partners that were reliable. So that was a really a, an issue. They expected that we were professionally and ethically competent. So when we got together, we started with uh, about one point half million dollars, and we started small. We only had uh, around uh, 100 workers. And throughout the time when we proved to be good in what we were doing, especially with the, as we were producing food, we had to be really good mm -hmm. regarding safety, regarding quality standards. And our aim was to become a world-class uh, food company. So we worked in that direction. Our north was always to do things good from all perspectives. If we wanted to have products with quality, we needed to assure that our people were well treated, that yeah. our people had quality in their performance. So for that, we needed to invest in our people. Yeah. Education, training, empowering women. So if, if I make a line, I can say that the economic growth in our company always went together with social development. And that sustainability lens allowed us to be selected by main banks around the world. So that is the way how we could get uh, funds in order to invest in our company. I want to say that when IDB called us about eight years ago and they said, Rosario, are you ready to go into the EDGE certification? I really have never heard about age before. And then I said, what is it? So when they told me, you are doing that. But what you need is a formal schema. And then I, I accepted the challenge. And really, that was for good and good and good. Because that gave us the structural schema to do the, the metrics, to do the measuring, to really uh, uh, incorporate uh, women in the different levels. So uh, nowadays, we are inspiring many other companies. We have become the only Peruvian company with age certification. And we did that in 2015. So nowadays, uh, Damper is really, our company is really making a, a good influence in, in Peruvian companies in order not to only work from the economic perspective, but work with the social and environmental perspective hand by hand. And the reason why, one of the reasons, powerful reasons that FinDEP chose us uh, for, for giving us an important credit was because we proved uh, in practice and through our age certification that gender equity was real, a real issue for our competitors. And okay. I have to say, Ex just, just on that, and, and also because Rosario is such a dynamo uh, <laughs> leader, I think that you, know, you have to have that inspiration there. So um, I think that you know, one of some of the things that you're seeing here is these inspirational women who don't take no for an answer, and that tenacity. And as you know, I think you hear this from people who are successful and stuff over time. That is a key, absolute key, and positive role models. Don't take no for an answer, and as Viola was saying, is 
are fully capable of role reversal between male and female yeah. roles when the occasion calls for it. Um, okay, I want to um, ask the same question to both the investors and investees as a final question, and we will preserve time for questions from the audience, so be thinking of those questions. So here's the question. Um, how can you better serve and support your women entrepreneur clients going forward? What are the kinds of things you're, you're thinking of? And then I want to ask the same question to the investees and see whether the answers bear any relationship to each other. Hmm. What, what kinds of products and services or support or um, including financial products um, are you thinking about that really uh, both help you find clients but also support them once you find them? So, uh, <clears throat> Can I answer the question kind of, uh, just, I, I've just come back from Pakistan, a week in Pakistan, and it was reminding me, listening to Rosario talk and you talking so powerfully and painfully about that ceiling. So we got invited to, we just opened up an office there and we're going to be putting several hundred million dollars of capital into the economy. And the, 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 the Chamber of Com Commerce organized a dinner for us. Um, amazing, pretty much all the main CEOs, some really smart CEOs, not one single woman, wow. 30 people. So when Priya, Priya was talking about 140 million people, Pakistan has 210 million people, and that's 105 women who do not, you know, I've, I honestly believe there's a lot of concrete ceilings. So I think one of the things that we can do, and by working together, you know, which I think I think in this gender area, and I think SDG 17 is the most important one, and I think it's you know a great tribute to all the people you know here and and, and Chantal and, uh, and Jen and, and and you guys making this 2x thing because I had nothing to do with it. I think you know where we can have impact at scale is changing the attitudes through our work. And a, on a systemic level. So we'll do the products and we need to do intermediated and directed lending. But I think the biggest impact we can have over the next 10 years is by changing the attitude in Africa and the poor parts of South Asia. Transformational. I okay. think so. Can I ask a question? Did you note in a large setting that there was not a woman present? I, I did. I said to them, I said, them, I said, we're coming back here again next year and we're going to have 30% of the people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is what we need. And my, my, to answer Nancy's question, hopefully quickly, um, I, I'm just so excited. I mean, to end on a note of optimism, we have large financial institutions that must have a commercial return saying that gender is material. And we're saying it to, we're saying it on stages like this, we're saying it to our folks that are applying for our capital, um, but it, it's going to take exactly what Graham said, all of us and the pension funds and the other institutional investors making that commitment as well. And I think we're on our way to do it. This, the fact that the G7 has come together and, and made this commitment is phenomenal. And we get on the phone way too much more often than we should and nudge each other. Really? CDC? You thought that was a 2x deal, and they're right back at us. We think that you could be doing this better, and we're learning so much from each other, and we're so committed. Um, and on what we are doing on products is we're looking at the whole point of 2x is not a shaming, it's a nudging. So if we have an enterprise that's in Jordan that only has 25% female um, employees and they don't have a quality indicator on employment, we're asking them to get there. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at, okay, if they make a commitment to get there and they don't get there, should we slap them with a fee? If they make a commitment and they exceed it, should we reduce our interest rates? So these are all things that we're thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think for, for us, you know, everything that we're looking at is has that gender lens to it. So, but what you're, when you're trying to do that and you're trying to encourage people, you know, first time women fund managers is, is you know, talking about your track record. That's always a, a tough sell. And of course, then you look at the individuals involved and you say, well, individually, they're really strong. Why can't they do this? They need to give them the opportunities. Um, and so when you look at the statistics, it's like 7% of uh, venture capital funding goes to women in, in Africa. So the, it's really dismal. So I think that collectively, I think you need that, that ability to push, like you were saying. And 2X is, is a form for that. Um, 
And also, I think that you also need to push in the non-traditional sectors. We've also been working in the renewable space where it's really hard to find women within this space, but I feel that if you can move the dial, push the dial, you know, getting women involved in STEM and all those different areas, I think that's super, super important. So it's top of mind for everything they're doing, and of course, working with our colleagues uh, in this space on the 2X and, you know, through the Invest Impact, which has been uh, created, we're encouraging uh, women uh, um, applicants to for this uh, uh, business plan and that kind of stuff. So I think that you need to raise awareness, and but then you need to follow through. Excellent. Okay, so lightning round. Viola. Uh, um, so sorry, from my Priya. perspective, when you're doing the next meeting in Pakistan, Graham, you should definitely do a lunch meeting and not a dinner meeting. Chances are you will also have them in turn. It's a really important point in terms of because all of us have to think through. Yeah. I'll say that as well. Um, this, uh, no so on I. <laughs> So it's good. It's good. <laughs> and it's 140 million children in India, so it's a it's it's a much larger country, and we have this whole. So from from my perspective, we have women and uh, men in the organization. My leadership teams equally uh, developed, and I see a difference between women and ma male leaders. So the three and Jen and I were talking about this at dinner yesterday. So I think just just general networking, their ability to see the trade off between scale and quality and their ability to develop a team and have, I think, confidence. I think there's an inherent diffidence that we see. So from, a, from an investor standpoint, it would be great if there was investment in these areas for women leaders. And there was not just the financial capital, but some degree of skilling as well in addition, which helped women think through this. And it's great if you have a woman counterpart in both the funds that I work with. Uh, I'm the only woman entrepreneur on both funds. And there are no women in the fund, both sides. So one would be great if we had women counterparts. The second would be if there was some specific skilling uh, and networking opportunities that were created. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> in my case, in the agri-industry in Peru, I am still the only one uh, founder in the agri-industry. So all the time I've been sitting in all the, the meetings and CEO, uh, always with men. So imagine nowadays that uh, Peru, I, I, I feel happy in the sense that I can feel that my country is awakening, is waking up in the sense of understanding why it is so important to have women in leading positions. So I would say, and I invocate women in Peru, that we should uh, uh, break the status quo and we should definitely go ahead and take leading positions. Because if we don't do that, we are never going to be role models for the new generations. They need to be inspired watching Peruvian women in leading positions. That is the reason why about three years ago, in my region, in the Chamber of Commerce, after 110 years of history, 110 years of history, only men for 110 years were presidents of the Chamber of Commerce. Nobody ever thought that a woman would go ahead. So when they proposed me to do, I said, would I have time to be in the Chamber of Commerce? Could I do good? So I had my doubts. But on the other hand, I said, if in 110 years there wasn't a woman, <laughs> and if the opportunity comes, I better I'm take it. No. And mm -hmm. not only because of myself, but because of all the women that were watching me. Yeah. And they would say, well, if Rosario could do it, then yeah. I can also do it. Mm -hmm. So that is basically my main inspiration in life. So it took me a lot of time because at my company, it demands a lot of my time because of the growth. So I was working, usually work from eight to eight. And then I said, how am I gonna do? I know that in my city, they made bets. <laughs> they did make bets because not many people didn't want a woman in front. And they said, Rosario, we know that she will probably do her best, but she will give up because Chamber of Commerce was, you know, very demanding and male dominated. Uh, dominated. So then I said, no, I cannot fail. So what I did, my meetings were after 8 in the evening, from 8 to 11. So 
at one moment and said, how am I going to do it? I did. I did. I did a lot of effort. And I did my period of two years. And the Chamber of Commerce was never in such a good position <laughs> as at the time. And then they re-elected again. Who did? Men. So what I wanted to say is that not only women, but I would say one of the most important issues is to have men behind, behind promoting, mm -hmm. like Gregor, promoting uh, uh, women, like Paul, promoting women to take leading positions and to show, because when men do it, because men are in the power position, most of the power positions in our country and in the world are occupied by men. So we need men, intelligent men, to understand that for the world and the society to, to be healthy, we need both to be matching and complement. That's the only way we can really advance. And I, as I always say, when a woman is able to give one step ahead, the society advances. All right, no pressure men out there in positions of power. The spotlight is on you. My thoughts are very short. Just we need new yardsticks to measure growth and success for women. It might not be a yardstick, it might be yard spaghetti, but it's got to be flexible. There's got to be a way to understand that b being underfunded, yet still being able to grow and meet competitors head for head, toe for toe, there has to be a way to ascribe value to the enterprises that we build because we do it with less very often. When we didn't get funded by our company, we missed 12 million in debt. But that was the year that we became organic at focusing on revenue so that we could have profitability even on a unit basis. And that came from bringing all kinds of skills to the table, not just having the advantage of going out and raising capital. So we are very, a very valuable company with not as many resources. And that, I think, is a, a very typical way in which female leadership tends to approach value building. So build a different yardstick for us, please. That, that's an interesting point. All right, I've been a bad um, moderator, but let's take five minutes and let's go to the audience. Let's collect a few questions because I'm sure that you will want to question the, these panel members. Uh, one in the back. Hi, um, thanks so much. I really enjoyed this presentation. Um, I'm currently working on a World Bank project on gender-based violence in DRC, um, looking at livelihoods. So this is a little tangent, but <laughs> given the cadence of the discussion, I was curious, um, uh, specifically with the investees, have you ever worked with um, a large organization on kind of a large-scale project where they've either used um, your existing um, organization as a pipeline to support livelihoods for beneficiaries, or if you provided training, um, technical assistance, or training throughout a project outside of your own, outside of your own um, staff and beneficiaries, and if you found it efficient or inefficient, or any guidance you would uh, give based on your experiences. Great. Um, let's collect a few questions. Any more? Uh, this gentleman in the second row, right here. <laughs> I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent have you been able to get meetings online so that people can see what's happening and participate? Me oh, meetings and online. For gathering the money and getting agreement on what will happen on projects. Often. Okay. And w one more question here. And this one over there. Hello, uh, Ruta Adis. And I, I wanted to ask about um, what you can share in terms of what on a surprising um, stories, like what Viola shared about showing the pictures of Africa and saying, this is Africa, not these other images that you've been flooded with over the years. What stories or experiences have you had that have helped shift people into accepting that this is what I want to support? Gender equality is so important. Why haven't I thought of this earlier? And okay. things that we haven't heard of. I, I just really like to hear from your own experiences. Thank you. Great. 
Was there one more question? All right, we'll take one more. We've got two there's, of them. There's one here time. as well. OK, thank you so much, everybody, for hanging in. Um, yes, we can take these. Um, Maria Fernanda Sierra from the Trust for the Americas. And my question is related to your messages about failure and safety nets, in a sense. So all of you mentioned that well, you created a huge safety net before you could actually start. Um, you mentioned, Rosario, that you couldn't afford to fail because you were the first woman. You mentioned that you have to be super reckless and ask everyone and that you accomplish high unit profitability rates on the unit. So I guess the stakes are so high that we as women are regarded with different yardstick that that pushes you to do better things. Mm -hmm. However, that's not healthy. Uh, so what um, advice or comments or suggestions or thoughts would you like to offer? Great question. OK. Two more, uh, lady in the second row, uh, lady and gentleman in the second and third row. I had a question on scale. If you could speak a little bit, sort of what helped you crack the scale sort of problem, and was there a particular thing that happened that made it uh, a little more possible for the business to grow in any of your cases? Hi, Max Ateva, consultant with Deloitte. Um, Question to the institutions here. Uh, we've talked about Africa, and, and thank you for a you know, wonderful panel. Uh, we all know that there's, there's a big problem about a missing gap in Africa in terms of investment. And part of the ceiling is actually with uh, women not being part of leadership or owning assets or leading companies. How do you go from, how do you, you know, answer the question around scale if you don't have women in that position, in a position where one, they're running businesses, two, they're in a room where it happens? When decisions are made, how do you how do you address that that problem uh -huh. as investors? Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so, uh, questions on training, um, online interaction, the right kinds of stories, uh, when the yardstick is higher, uh, scale, um, and these missing middle questions that the gentleman. So, um, let me give an, an opportunity for everybody to say a last word and ch choose any of these questions. <clears throat> Who what wants was the to first there? lady's question again? Uh, in terms of scaling and training. Oh, scale. I know what you, um, I can tell you specifically. It's becoming a real thing to find ways to fund internally displaced people. Um, I, in our business model, because we manage assets, which relates to you, we picked a business model that would not exclude women from financial services because traditional lending relies on bank accounts, land, and all of these things. Not all women have that. So by switching to what is basically Islamic finance, we became so much more ethically available. What this means regarding to what you've said is those individuals in Cameroon that is going through a very quiet civil war at the present moment, we were able to protect the assets of our customers by teaching them that there is value in moving your goods to another warehouse. It's that simple. When we did that and were able to not lose footing in Cameroon, we had other organizations come to us to find out whether or not there were ways in which to use our model to help fund in, in, uh, internally displaced people. It's not my focus. One of the things I've learned becoming a responsible business owner is I cannot chase cats, period. It's not my focus. I like what you're doing. You might have to talk to somebody else. This is the little that I've done. I'm happy to share it with you and you move along. So that sort of is related to the gentleman whose question is to institutional investors. You're right, it's horrifically unhealthy. I wish there was a vitamin tablet for that. But the way in which I have learned to defray that is something that I think is very gender oriented. I love to go run to somebody else who knows better than I do. I don't have to carry all of that on my shoulder. I used to be that way. I used to think that to be really successful, I had to be able to do absolutely everything all by myself. My reckless enthusiasm is in my DNA. Can't help it. Everything is freaking exciting, <laughs> even when it isn't. It's always like, but this could lead us to the next great thing. However, I am very conscious to hire people around me who will tell me, stop it. That's not going to work. And on top of that, we are often, as female leaders, concerned about how our behavior impacts the human beings that follow us and make their daily living based on the choices that we make. Because even though I have a delta for all kinds of risk, not everybody I am responsible for. 
does. So I must make sure that I am backstopped by individuals who are diversified in the team in perspective, morality even, across a number of perspectives. That has saved me from wrecking other people. Otherwise, I'd carry on. And I think that answers three, and I can leave yeah, the rest. Excellent. Uh, I, I don't think I have a direct answer for your question, but mm, for us, we we look at creating these safe spaces for women because we hire women and from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And so we focus on trying, and this, actually, our client organizations have now started adopting from us. So while we've not proactively gone out and said, here is how you should work with a diverse set of women. In, in our centers, we would have 40 or 50 women who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And um, the difference between a male colleague or my husband and I is the fact that I'm thinking about 10 things as I'm walking into work, childcare, my aging in-laws, uh, you know, what the cook has to make, and <laughs> chances are in an hour I'll get a call on uh, you know, something about homework. So there's a bunch of things. And what we try and create is mechanisms for people to dissipate that. Just given, I, I spoke about the fact that happy adults equal happy children. So the adults around the children, we try and you know get them these areas in which they can be a bit more of themselves and talk about issues more actively. And that, I think, as female leaders, it's very important. So if I say I have a mom-in-law issue at home, it sort of suddenly diffuses it across the organization. People share a little bit more actively. So um, that's something that we've done. And now a lot of our client organizations uh, adopt from us. I'm not sure whether it directly answers your question, but I thought it was worthwhile sharing. On the scale, I think the at the unit economics level, one there are other there are other companies who do this and do it. You know, so there is some merit in studying whether they um, how they did it, and is there an organic feature to the growth, or is there uh, inflection that you can drive through infusion of capital? But I'm old-fashioned. In fact, with one of the investors we had, I said, we're profitable. And they said, oh, does that mean there is no growth left in the market? And I was like, really? Since when is it unfashionable to be profitable? But <laughs> at the unit level, if you get it right, and then you understand what are the diseconomies of scale. And this is a simple answer. But the reality is, if you figure out when you're putting multiple units together, what creates the diseconomies of scale? And when do you turn profitable versus when do you grow? all of us chase growth, but at the end of the day, I think businesses have to be sustainable. Yeah. And driving that uh, you know, into, into your core DNA is really, really good. So those are two questions I'll stop yeah. because there Please. are enough folks here. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, I would just want to add uh, that uh, sustainability uh, has to do uh, clearly when uh, uh, the economic uh, objectives uh, do not uh, are not opposite to the to the social balance uh, that uh, we get. So from that perspective, we are um, all all the time trying to uh, uh, invest in the skills and the training of uh, our people, women and men. Nowadays, uh, fifty percent of our uh, people in our organization are are women, and we can see that uh, we, we still need to lift women into the higher uh, levels of the organization because I can see that uh, the brain, our brain, is women's brain, uh, are, are differently, clearly, from, from men's brain. And I can see that whenever we make, when we have decisions to make, uh, it enriches so much when we have women and men. So having this diversity in the different committees that we make decisions in the company are, are really positive to make, a, to make better quality uh, decisions and especially, again, to inspire other women to, to, uh, to break whatever ceilings are there uh, and go ahead. So one of, our, uh, main, one of the main challenges uh, we are having now is how we prepare for uh, the, the future because um, nowadays the environment is changing in such a fast speed that we really need to encourage more women, uh, to, to encourage gender parity, mm -hmm. uh, to, to encourage more women to take over uh, uh, le uh, leading positions in, uh, in our country. 
And I would say that as we are still a few people doing that, um, we, we always um, need to go ahead and, and share the experiences we, we, we have so the investors can also see how uh, when women are prepared enough, we are able, it's not a matter of gender, it's a matter of being prepared and uh, invest in cultivating ourselves throughout the time so we can be able to take the opportunity when, when it comes. Where it comes. I would say that um, one of the, some of the things that I think it's incumbent upon us as, as uh, investors is that we need to think outside the box a little bit sometimes. And I think we also, you know, to your point about spaghetti or, or, or yardsticks, um, we now also need to, to think of new rules of the game, take into consideration the constraints that women have, mm -hmm. uh, and, and factor that into our investments, you know, through its technical assistance or however we can do it. I think that it's truly incumbent upon us to kind of think of, of new ways of, of encouraging um, um, participation, uh, new ways, new financial structures, uh, and new uh, ways of learning and helping bring, bring those people up to, to uh, create those opportunities. A uh, quick story on getting people bought in on the importance of gender equality. A lot of, I have found that folks in development that truly believe in impact, there's a lot of them, particularly men, who say, we don't have to call out gender because we're doing amazing work and everyone's benefiting. And this is sort of adding another piece on the puzzle. Um, we at OPIC, um, if you looked at our portfolio, after energy is financial services. So we do a lot of lending to local financial institutions to get li liquidity into their markets and ask them to lend to small medium enterprises. We've done that for a very long time. Um, there's an investment officer um, who's a curmudgeon, not interested in 2x. I happen to love him as a person. You know, we hang out. And he's always very like, bleh, not into it. Um, so I just kind of brought him along and said, you know, when, in your next deal, ask them these few questions, okay? So, it, for example, in this market, at least 30% of SMEs are owned by women. Let's find out from this bank what percent of their portfolio is to female borrowers. Let's also ask them about their management mm -hmm. and if there are women in management. I mean, he came back to me, fear. he's like, they don't even track it. <laughs> they have no idea. And, and there's not one woman in the entire thing. Not one female. I mean, he was so offended that the numbers were so bad from this one experience. So I think it's if you can have people with that personal experience, again, not in a shaming way, but in a let's just ask these questions just in case we're missing something. I find that to be compelling. Um, so just. Great story. I mean, that is uh, so. T two stories, uh, African successes. Um, two years ago, I was in Cote d'Ivoire and I met a lady called Binta Ndoye. She's CEO of Ora Bank, one of the biggest banks in West oh, Africa. Yeah. She's Malian. She worked up through the ranks. Probarco ended up helping her sponsorship go in Paris. She's running this thing. She was amazing. I took a photo with her and talked to my two kids, my two daughters, and said, so You've got to be like Binta when you're older. <laughs> Second story, because I think a lot of this comes internally, is about personal leadership. And in the yeah. CDC, we have a director in our financial services team called Maria Lagi. She goes to, to Pakistan, Karachi, four times a year. It's dangerous. It's incredibly male chauvinistic organizations. She's persuaded the company we're working with Shell to put a woman uh, on the board. She's working to create kind of a structure like the one you did, Shantar, with uh, lending for women, you know, to, for this, you know, 104 million opportunity. So I think it's about, you know, it's like you just said, you know, um, you know, men changing their behavior, people like me doing a better job, and successful women are seeing that and believing it and, you know, following, because this is a success story, a success opportunity, not, yeah. it's not a failure. Yeah. Excellent way to end. Well, this is, it's been an absolute pleasure participating in this conversation. I'm sure you all agree. Let, join me in thanking this marvelous panel. Thank you.